Lucy is a PhD candidate in Global Governance and Environment at the University of Waterloo and the Balsillie School of International Affairs. Her previous degrees are both in international development from Waterloo and Dalhousie University in Halifax. Lucy's dissertation research focuses on global governance of nutrition policy and guidance with a focus on countries in the global south and the power relationships that go into building this policy. Right now, she's living in Ottawa, doing a research project for the International Development Research Centre on front-of-the-pack nutrition labelling in the Caribbean, which she would love to tell you all about if you have more to ask. She also has side hustles that include teaching yoga and gliding in the Royal Canadian Air Cadet program, but not at the same time. <laughs> she loves all things food, with a special affinity for zucchini, broccoli, and Cadbury mini eggs, which is shared with most of us. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Today, I am here to talk about the future of food. And that is a really big topic. Um, food is big. The future of food is really big. And it's bigger than the Lucky Charms that you had for breakfast this morning. And it's bigger than the wine and cheese that I know you're all really here for. It's bigger than choosing to shop at the farmer's market to lower greenhouse gas emissions. And it's also bigger than choosing French's ketchup over Heinz to support Leamington tomato manufacturers. Food is bigger than the choices that we consciously make because there's also a lot of choices that we're not consciously making as consumers. We're integrated into a global system of food whether we want to be or not. And this is a complex system of global food trade influenced by the decisions of multinational corporations, state governments, and consumer trends and demands. So today, this is where I want us to go. I want to make the case that the global food system has historically been and continues to be unjust. That the resulting food environments make it difficult for everyone in the world to eat healthfully. At the same time, global organizations are working hard to create policy that will eventually create food systems that make everybody healthier and are more equitable. But in these spaces, power and politics can get in the way. So to make good food policy, we need spaces where voices are heard in a balanced, equitable, and fair and inclusive way. And that's where my research comes in. So let's take stock of this system. Over 800 million people in the world today are undernourished. Two billion people suffer from overweight and obesity. But we can't talk about where we're going the future of food without talking about how we got here. So I'm going to present a highly selective version of global food history. So around 12,000 BC, humans shifted from nomadic hunters and gatherers to agrarian communities with domesticated agriculture. Throughout most of human history, though, the main food problem was hunger. Peasant farmers who produced the vast majority of food didn't eat enough calories to sustain lives. At the outset of our modern epoch, 19th century Britain's factory workers were fueled by new forms of agricultural techniques, as well as imported food from colonies. Monocropped wheat was turned into bread, served alongside imported sugar in tea that fueled factory workers to be able to get through their long shifts in, in these factories. At the same time, the colonies were being hollowed out to make sure that food could get to the coastlines for export. For example, India's train system was built largely around bringing resources from the hinterland to the coast for that export, rather than for any sort of local benefit. Similarly, in the Caribbean, the monocrop plantations for sugar developed an agricultural system that was largely focused on export, reducing the capacity in the Caribbean for diversity of diets, which is a problem that's continued to this day. In the early 1900s, the first dietary guidelines were produced. And this was really about ensuring people got enough to eat, especially during wartime. It was about getting calories into humans. And yes, you are correct, that is an entire food group dedicated to butter. Over the 20th century, imperial countries lost control of these colonies. And as independence became more and more common and 
colonizers were ousted, a void was created that many times corporations from the same originating countries as the colonizers came into. Over later decades in the 20th century, those corporations' influence was concentrated and we got to this point of corporate concentration that we see in the food system today. So let's go back to where we're at right now. 800 million people in the world are undernourished. Probably unsurprisingly, most of these are in the global south, in developing countries. Overweight and obesity affect two billion people. Maybe more surprisingly, more children who are overweight and obese are in the global south rather than the global north. Public health researchers call this multiple forms of malnutrition, where under and overnutrition exist side by side. More and more countries are experiencing overweight and obesity right next to hunger because of the way that the food system has developed over time and this way that we've evolved to prioritize processed and cheap foods that will feed a lot of people. Often we hear that the food system is broken. The food system actually works really well as long as our approach is to feed a lot of people. And we need to feed a lot of people, but we need to feed a lot of people better than we're feeding them right now. One way that researchers discuss the experience of changing food system is through food environments. You can think of this as the way that you purchase, prepare, and or consume food in your life. The evolution of food systems over time has gone hand in hand with the way that our food environments have changed in all parts of the world. Public health advocates argue that our food environments aren't healthy. These unhealthy food environments mean it isn't easy to eat healthy, and in fact, it's hard to eat healthy. And this shows up in a lot of ways. For you, it might mean not being able to grab a healthy snack of fruits and vegetables when you're stuck on campus all day. And it might also mean not being able to have time to cook a home-cooked meal when you have three jobs to work to make ends meet. Or it might mean relying on cheap imported rice to feed your family if you're a subsistence farmer who doesn't have, who can't afford the diversity of diet that we know is good for us. So overnutrition is no longer a problem in just northern developed countries. Food environments everywhere and global food trade is now focused on the sale of processed and ultra-processed foods. The worldwide integration of the global food system and the historical inequity are partly what makes this such a difficult problem. We have these huge complex problems and we have to solve them through collective action, bringing all stakeholders to the table. These inclusive forms of governance where we come together to make decisions aren't always perceived as legitimate because as we've seen too often, decisions in global food systems have been made by Northern countries, whether that's colonial powers or the corporations that are based in those former colonial countries. So my research focuses on global agendas and governance organizations that are trying to make healthier and more equitable food systems for everyone. I'm particularly interested in how we make decisions that affect how we eat and what we eat. Who gets to make those decisions? I'm especially interested in the power and the politics of these processes. So global agendas are often kind of fuzzy and many organizations can come together to work on action plans that might be more or less defined. So quick show of hands, who in the room has heard of the sustainable development goals? Great, that's exactly what I was hoping for. And I assume that you have seen these before, not just because it makes all academic slides look way more colorful and interesting, but also because they're everywhere right now. The SDGs and before them, the Millennium Development Goals, are the best example we have of how a galvanizing and global agenda can work. We can argue how effectively it's, these goals are being met, but we can probably all agree that actors are fitting themselves into the goals. So agendas matter because they direct our funding and they direct our attention to specific problems and solutions. Agendas that are globally agreed on, like the SDGs, can shape action. Sometimes though, we have agendas that are a lot fuzzier than the SDGs. Global agendas can be made up of different frameworks, guidance and policy created by many different organizations, governments and conferences that end up coming together to create a sort of general route towards a sort of general future that we all want to go for. 
So I'm going to say organizations in this presentation, even though sometimes I actually mean forums or venues, just to make it a little easier. And what I want to focus on is a space where people are making the decisions that create agendas, where and how people shape public action on food systems. Most of my dissertation research focuses on the Committee for World Food Security. The CFS receives its core funding from three different UN bodies, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, the World Food Program, and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. This committee's tasks are to coordinate a global approach to food security, promote policy convergence, support and advise countries and regions, coordinate at national and regional levels, promote accountability and share best practices, and to develop a global strategic framework for food security and nutrition. But the CFS is not the only actor in this space, and in fact, they're one of many actors in the space. The landscape is made up of intergovernmental bodies, private foundations, development agencies, NGOs, and even corporations in partnership. And if we open up our consideration to global actors who influence nutrition but don't have an explicit mandate, our map gets really messy. So why does the CFS matter in a fight for a better, healthier food system for all, when they're just one of many actors? Because they make decisions that will influence agendas on public policy and development. Remember the tasks of the CFS. They are supposed to develop a global strategic framework, coordinate a global approach to food security, promote policy co convergence, and you get the point here. In 2017, the CFS's high-level panel of experts released a big report on food systems and nutrition. These reports are intended to give objective and current information to country delegations at the CFS to use both domestically to form their own policy and also to inform their decisions and discussions at the CFS itself. This is important because some countries don't have the capacity to create this type of report, and they can all benefit from the same knowledge that's produced and given out here. These are essentially meta-analyses of some sort of specialized literature written for politicians and bureaucrats who don't have a background in the topic. But these are not brief reports. These are, reports are deep dives. And the reports then inform the discussions on how the CFS can move forward and create better food policy, in this case, on nutrition and food systems. So as you can see, the report did a great job of simplifying the concept of food systems. And this graphic is supposed to be that simplification. And don't worry, I know it's not. Um, what this graphic does show, though, is a lot of what we've already talked about. The diets are changing. And alongside that, food environments are changing. And those are shaped by supply chains, which ask where our foods are produced and how did they get onto our, into our supermarkets and onto our tables. And all of this is driven by biophysical environments for growing food historical traditions and culture, and especially political and economic drivers like leadership, globalization, and trade. So this discussion led the CFS to dr begin drafting voluntary guidelines on food systems and nutrition. The voluntary guidelines will give governments and other stakeholders guidance on effective policies to address all forms of malnutrition. They aim to contribute to reshaping food systems to ensure healthy diets. And one example of one of the policies that's outlined is linking farm to school. So the voluntary guidelines say that this can improve the supply of nutritious foods to schools while creating opportunities for stable and predictable markets for local farmers. How this is often done in countries is local farmers giving, or sorry, selling food to schools for school lunch programs. Other examples in the guidelines are initiatives saying initiatives can positively contribute to school-aged children's nutrition knowledge, including eating habits and consumption behavior. They don't actually outline the ways that this can happen, but they have linking farm to school and these sort of vague descriptions. Another example is transparency information on labels. So voluntary or mandatory approaches to front of pack labels are one way to inform consumers, shape preferences, and encourage reformulation of products. 
And the voluntary guidelines also suggest that education campaigns can help consumers understand these labels. I want to be clear, though, that these examples are not from the voluntary guidelines. The voluntary guidelines don't offer any specific labels or suggest best practices. These labels are actually from a Health Canada consultation. And this is important to note because it shows that the guidelines are currently quite vague. We often see this in global policy documents because it allows individual countries to adopt guidelines in a way that suits their context best. And while we hope this is done to protect consumers and form healthier systems for people and planet, we also know that some countries are highly influenced by economic and corporate interests. So the guidelines are voluntary, but we do know that some countries will adopt guidelines without any changes. So the way the guidelines are drawn up and how specific they are matters to those countries especially. Usually these are countries with very small populations or very poor countries, often countries in the south. But it also matters to the entire global food system because as we now understand how integrated the global food system is. Now this historical integration has never been directed by any sort of central body, and, but there have been default power centers over time, as we've seen through colonial food trade and power concentrated in the corporate food system. Power and decision making over time has been largely centered in the West and in Northern countries. The food system that evolved in this environment, as we have seen, doesn't serve our global population well. It means that politically, these voluntary guidelines have a lot riding on them. They can shape the agenda on food and nutrition moving forward. If the recommendations in the guidelines are taken up by different countries and adopted as a way to shape action moving forward, then a lot of different interests will have a stake in how they're developed and what they say. So the zero draft of these guidelines have just been released, which means countries will read the initial draft and submit comments to the Secretariat. The Secretariat collates the comments and adapts the document to fit the comments that were received. You can imagine how many different perspectives are trying to be merged in this process. The CFS also has space for the private sector and the civil society to give their opinions and comments through groups called the Private Sector Mechanism and the Civil Society Mechanism, the CSM and the PSM for short. This means that anyone can submit comments, but only countries get to vote on things when it gets to that point in the process. The CFS is known as the most inclusive intergovernmental body on food security, but at its large scale meetings, only one or two representatives will speak for the entire civil society mechanism. The CSM though is made up of all of these constituents, smallholder farmers, pastoralists, ag and food workers, women, consumers, fisher folk, indigenous peoples, landless, youth, and the food insecure, among other regional representatives as well. So groups representing those people get together to form a position, which is then presented as the entire CSM position. That is then submitted to the CFS, where working groups adopt comments or reject them. Eventually, the whole CFS will get to vote on the guidelines, but not the private sector and civil society, as we know, who don't get a vote. In the fall, the CFS has regional consultations to gather more comments to shape these guidelines. So you can see that by the time the guidelines will come to a vote, one smallholder farmer's opinion will have gone through many steps to make it to the final document. And that's only if someone else's opinion didn't contradict it, especially if that someone has more power, like a country delegation with a vote. And because this is a public process, all of these official written uh, comments are published on the website. And this is where I come in. I collect these comments and look at which comments are accepted and which ones are rejected and left out of the final document. I also interview people involved in the process to understand the politics, power, and interests that are at stake in forming the document. For example, if guidelines moving forward encourage limited consumption of processed foods, countries who are big producers of crops that eventually become those processed foods things like soy, canola, corn, and wheat, might have an economic interest in containing these guidelines. Or companies with interests that maintain the status quo might lobby their governments to have them produced in a way that suits them. On the other hand, if a country has mostly smallholder subsistence farmers, the kind who are already supportive and doing a more climate-sensitive agriculture, 
These people might actually get first mover benefits if policies begin to shift in the direction of sustainable consumption. These countries might then push for the types of policies because they'll benefit from them. But those countries and some constituencies don't have resources to send delegates to these meetings. That's why these attempts at inclusive bodies and transparent, transparent processes for policy development are so important. Agendas shape action and policy, but different players have more ability to be heard than others. And even when they're all heard, not everyone is listened to in the same way. So my hope is that as I follow this process, inclusive bodies and inclusive processes like this can produce policy and guidance that will shape our food system to make it healthier and more equitable for everyone. So if you ask me about the future of food, I'm likely to get into a lot of very boring policy processes. But what I hope you take out of this is that the organizations matter, that the policies matter. And if we make sure that all voices are heard, no matter how much power they have individually, I think we'll have a better food system for all. So it matters how we convene, what we say, and who gets listened to. So I was here today to talk to you about the future of food. But really, I guess what I want to say is that the food is our future and that we all have a stake in it and that everybody deserves an equally bright and healthy future. Thank you. So luckily I get to stay up here and go right into my dear friend George's introduction. So George is a PhD student in the biology department here at UWaterloo. His previous degrees include an undergrad in psychology from McGill University in Montreal and a master's in biological science from University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. He's currently working in Brian Dixon's lab on fish immunology in species important to Canadian aquaculture. This is appropriate considering he grew up on a small fish farm on Vancouver Island in BC. Although his current work is not tied to his family farm, he hopes to come full circle back to doing research in BC one day. Here's George. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. So I want to zoom in a little bit. Uh, from that very broad perspective and talk about aquaculture, more specifically Canadian aquaculture. But as Lucy was mentioning, um, I have a long history with this. So I figured I'd start with just a few little trips down memory lane, at least for myself. So that would be me with the open mouth um, amongst my brothers as my mom uh, ties down halls. Those are the things that keep our containment nets uh, uh, from drifting too much in the, in the currents. Um, a little bit older, there we are with our dog that uh, was recruited to bark seals away from our fish because that's one of the ways you can control those, those blighters. And that's my little brother who uh, factors, he's uh, by my side apparently in all these photos essentially. That's us uh, showing off one of our wonderful Chinook salmon, which as I was saying we don't work on, but uh, they are absolutely delicious. And uh, that's when uh, we got a little bit older and we're a little bit more used to our folks. Uh, on the farm itself. So in the background there, you can see not only the lovely uh, coast of Quadra Island, but also the containment nets that I was talking about. That's our, our rickety old pen system. So I'll get back to aquaculture, but I wanna first of all talk about a parallel uh, in the way that we obtain food on land. And uh, as Lucy was pointing out, for most of our history, human beings have been hunter-gatherers. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that hunting and gathering generates very few excess calories. So uh, what you're seeing here is uh, on the horizontal axis, uh, the various methods for obtaining food that uh, are common, and then the density that's supported by it. And you can see that uh, the, sh the modern densities of population that we have these days are only supported by some form of farming, uh, more specifically modern farming. So hunting suffers from the fact that it doesn't generate much in the way of calories, and it also has a problem in terms of uh, generating population collapse and extinction. If you've heard the expression dead as a dodo, then you're familiar with the canonical version of something that was hunted to extinction. But this is actually an even more uh, uh, apt 
uh, example. This is an illustration of what it was like to be under a passenger pigeon flock. So these animals existed in North America in numbers estimated into the billions when Europeans first arrived. And uh, they would flock to, they congregate in flocks that were uh, apparently numbered in the millions. And if eyewitness accounts are to be believed, they would pass overhead and block out the sun for days on end. But of course, people with their rifles showed up and uh, the fact that it looked endless meant that people hunted them right to the end, such that the very last one, a female named Martha, died in the Cincinnati Zoo in the early 1900s. Um, additionally, there's some evidence to suggest that hunting was involved in the loss of at least a few of the 36 now extinct species of North American megafauna. Um, so I'll just give you a moment to think about how cool it would be if some of those guys were still kicking around. These are some of the costs uh, that come with that method of gaining food. So most of the hunting that takes place today, as basically everybody knows, is only very tangentially related to feeding ourselves. We've moved on to producing the vast majority of our nutrients and calories in the practice of agriculture. So gaining gaining nutrients through the cultivation of crops in controlled settings and animals as well. So none of this I'm sure is news to most of you, but what may be news is that a similar process has been happening in the oceans of our waters, or in the waters of our world. Uh, it, in this case, a transition from a form of hunting or capture fisheries, which is basically any method of uh, obtaining food from the ocean that depends on wild stocks. Uh, over to a form of farming, in this case, aquaculture. So this transition is happening, at least in part, due to the troubles that uh, arise from the impacts of fishing. Uh, specifically, it's very difficult to estimate the size of marine populations when they occupy the depths, and this quite easily leads to mismanagement. Uh, additionally, uh, even if you have proper management within the waters of one country, uh, very few fish species respect these boundaries. And as a result, you can end up with overfishing in international waters. So uh, a fairly good example of this, although it has not resulted in extinction yet, is the uh, Lake Whitefish fishery that existed in the Great Lakes. This uh, collapsed in the 1950s, or the population collapsed to the extent that uh, the fishery was terminated in the 1950s. And this was due to a kind of tragedy of the common situation where you had American and Canadian fishermen, and then also the introduction of invasive species. So another way in which fishing has an impact that I think is rarely appreciated is in pollution of our ocean systems. So, Many of you will have heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and if you're anything like me, when you read about this, uh, you had pictures of a floating island of garbage, like the one at the top there, uh, that was largely derived from consumer products, right? One imagines plastic bags and bottles and packaging and these sorts of things. Uh, however, if it were an island of garbage the size of Texas in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, it would be easily visible on any satellite picture, right? But when you go looking for it, all you find is what you see at the top there, which is a collection of coastal debris that you can tell it's been recently washed off of the, uh, the coast, or you find a picture of the uh, Pacific Ocean with a big circle around it. So we, I looked into this and it turns out that there's a very good reason for this. You can't see the Pacific Garbage Patch because it's largely made up of neutrally buoyant material. So that means it's floating just below the surface. And additionally, this 2018 study went out and uh, sampled it and found that 85% of it is indeed plastics, which makes sense because they're buoyant. But 46% uh, of the plastics were derived from fishing. This is discarded fishing tackle nets buoys and ropes. So even if we're to leave aside the problems of pollution and everything, there's a shift from fishing to aquaculture that's happening for a supply demand reason as well. This particular graph captures it quite well. Um, this is just a measure of the production of fish protein from our seas in tons. And the blue on the bottom is what we derive from capture fisheries. The yellow or orange on top is what we derive from aquaculture. And I just want to uh, draw your attention to three things. First of all, 
that the demand for food from the ocean is increasing, has been increasing over time, and is projected to increase into the future. Uh, secondly, that the blue on the bottom, the capture fisheries have been flatlining since about the 1990s. Now this makes perfect sense. There are a number of surveys out there that have suggested that anywhere from 60 to 80% of the stocks that are being fished at the moment are either maximally exploited or overexploited. So that's why you can see that the projection is for the amount of this from capture fisheries to decline in the near future. And the final thing I want to point out is that what's making up the difference between the increasing demand and the diminishing supply is an explosion in aquaculture all over the world. So aquaculture is the rearing of any economically viable species uh, in the waters of our world. Uh, a lot of it takes place in Asia in freshwater where they raise carp and shrimp and have been doing so for many, many years. But when it comes to Canada, the vast majority of what we grow here is in salt water and focuses on finfish and shellfish. So zooming in a little bit more, the aquaculture in Canada is dominated almost exclusively by this particular species, the Atlantic salmon. Um, the vast majority of these are grown on the west coast, which is not what you would expect. You'd expect Pacific salmon to be grown out there, but this is just the nature of the beast. These animals were originally uh, uh, domesticated in Norway in the 1970s, and although they're all the way across, they use stocks from there. Uh, and so then when it came time to uh, export this process, uh, all around the world, including from the west or the east coast of Canada to the west coast, they simply used the domesticated stock because it was well established. So, as you can imagine, having a high density of this economically viable species and having it be a monoculture is a massive increase in disease risk. And this is one of the major problems faced by salmon farmers going forward. Uh, outbreaks of disease spread very rapidly through a population and can generate losses of up to 40% of the stock. Now, losses of this size are crippling for all but the absolute largest of producers, and it's certainly no fun for them either. This is a problem that is also projected to get worse over time. So the thing is, we grow salmonids, which are a cold water species, and as you can see from this graph, which is logging the temperature flux over the last 50 years in the surface waters of our oceans, uh, there has been a warming trend, as everybody knows, and the trend is bound to continue. It's kind of difficult to see this. So this is a pixelated blow up of North America there, just to show you that uh, the, the coastal waters where we actually carry out our uh, salmonid aquaculture here in Canada are among the ones experiencing this increased temperature flux. So the way that salmon farmers deal with problems of disease nowadays are largely covered by twofold. One of them is antibiotics and the other is immunization. The first of these comes with problems of expense to a certain extent and also problems of public perception. Of course, nobody likes the idea of antibiotics. Uh, the second, immunization, is very costly, very time intensive, and it also only confers limited protection at this point. And this reflects from the fact that our understanding of the teleost immune system, which is what allows you to generate the immune memory, that is the whole point of immunization, is uh, incomplete at this particular point. So our lab is focused on a third sort of way forward which is the idea of using biomarkers of robust immune performance to identify fish for breeding the next generation. So as the waters warm up, we're trying to find the fish that will respond well if should such an outbreak of disease happen. So when you're looking for biomarkers of robust immune performance, the cytokines are the ones that float up to the top right away. These are small proteins that are produced by many cells of the body, but largely the immune cells of the body, and they are responsible for governing almost all of the actions of the immune system, both in mammals and in teleosts. From the uh, B cells that make antibodies that allow and also allow us to have immune memory, to the phagocytes that run around our bodies eating up foreign invaders, they are all governed by cytokines. So what we do in our lab is we take the 
cytokine sequence from a salmon and we clone it into a bacteria in order to get the bacteria to produce what's called a recombinant protein. So that's just a protein made by you. It's not native. Uh, we then take this protein and purify it and immunize host animals. So we use goats, chickens, and rabbits at this point. When you immunize the animal, it mounts an immune response, which involves generating antibodies that bind specifically to the protein that it was immunized with. So in this case, we can collect from the animals an anti-cytokine antibody. So these bind very, very tightly to the cytokine in, in, that we're interested in. We then collect and purify the antibody and design and optimize assays. So the major assay that we use is something called an ELISA, which is an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So the major important pieces of this are just that we're using those antibodies that we raised in the various animals uh, to, you can see the one on the bottom there, you coat a plate with it, and then you apply a sample, and any cytokine that's in that sample will bind to that antibody and will be retained when you wash things away. You then use a second cytokine-specific antibody to detect on the top. That's why this is called a sandwich ELISA. And then other antibodies are applied to amplify the signal, and you then make, then you add a, uh, an enzyme, that's the enzyme part, that makes a colored product, which we then pick up. And this will be relative to the amount of cytokine in your particular sample. So this is just a, a, a typified version of what it looks like when you do uh, ELISAs on fish that have been injected with a stimulant over time. So these are from spleen samples, and the only real takeaway from this are that we're detecting it down at a very low level. Picograms per milliliter is a very low amount of the cytokine, but that is actually the levels at which these things are active. You don't need much cytokine to get a lot of bang for your buck. So that's I, I, what, what we labor for, and that's essentially what it looks like. So, in terms of giving the importance of these tools, I just want to give a little vignette from our farm. So when we first started salmon farming about 30 years ago, my folks were basically just doing what everybody does. We were feeding antibiotics to our fish. And after about five years or so in some research, they decided that they wanted to dispense with this. Uh, and within, it was literally overnight, 60% of our stock just dropped dead. Now, the, again, like I said, this is crippling for anybody but the largest, and we certainly were very small at that time, but it happened that it, our farm was basically a hobby farm. My folks had other jobs, and so as a result, we were able to muddle along, and the 40% that was left over were, of course, the fish that were naturally resistant to the local pathogens. So with those fish and subsequent years and subsequent breeding, we have bred a stock that is naturally resistant. You can raise them without antibiotics, and you have basically perfectly acceptable levels of general mortality over time. So the broad idea with these tools is that they may be able to help us identify those fish without the expedient of having to let 60% of them die beforehand. So in general, what we would do is take different families of fish, and expose them to high temperature and an immune challenge, and then take your high performers and your low performers and try to find a difference in the levels of one or more of these cytokines. And that could theoretically translate into a biomarker that you could trace through to identify the robust animals for the future. Additionally, being able to keep a very close eye on the immune reaction of any particular animal or a group of animals is very useful for tracking the effectiveness of an immunization program. Because like I was saying, it's all about generating memory. And at the moment, our particular immunization programs only do that to a limited extent. So it's hoped that with these tools, we'll be able to help Canadian aquaculture move into the very warm future that it has and possibly be able to uh, uh, help supply the increased amount of fish protein that people are looking for in the future. Indeed, this is a 2014 Nature paper that was looking at trends in people's diet, and it seems as though they expect that in the future there may be upwards of 80% more seafood in people's diets going forward. It seems like people like seafood. So 
with that, I just say thank you guys very much and thank you to the organizers for a chance to talk and uh, those are my references. <laughs>